How will the Dallas Cowboys replace Jake Ferguson if he's unable to go in week two? All that and more in this episode of the Locked On Cowboys Podcast. You are Locked On Cowboys, your daily Dallas Cowboys podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Locked On Cowboys podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We'd like to thank you for making us your first listen of the day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Just visit FanDuel.com to get started. Welcome back. I'm your host, Marcus Mosier. You can follow me on Twitter at Marcus underscore Mosier. Joining me today, as always, is Lana McCool. You can follow him on Twitter at McCoolBCB. We're going to answer your Twitter questions today, including which players exceeded expectations in week one? How can the Cowboys now start to plan for a future without Dak in 2028, 20, 29, wherever, mm-hmm. whenever that happens? But let's start with the Jake Ferguson news. So, yeah. Luckily, it seems like the Cowboys lucked out here. Jake Ferguson has a MCL sprain in a bone bruise. When it initially happened, my fear was that this was a season-long injury. Now, it appears that there's a chance he could play in week two. But if we've learned anything about Mike McCarthy, he's going to err on the side of caution with this. I'm going to bet that he doesn't play in week two. If he doesn't, how do the Cowboys replace his production? Hunter. Lipke. No, I, I, <laughs> uh, listen, first of all, that was the first guy that, that was mentioned when they talked about the Ferguson. Replacement. It was. And so I, 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 I'm only half joking here. Um, I, I think that, the, but I think, you know, the, the funny thing about that was when the question was asked, I'm sure that the, the answer that everyone was hoping for or looking for was who would be replacing Ferguson's targets in the passing game. And I think that the answer that McCarthy gave was, who will be replacing Ferguson and all the other aspects of what Fer- of what uh, Ferguson does, right? right? And so I think that, you know, like, you're, you're going to throw the ball. You're going to see what you've got in John Stevens Jr. this week. Is he going to be able to come back off that hamstring injury? Uh, if he is, then, you know, you'll probably get uh, an opportunity to see him dressed and maybe get a couple targets. But I, I do think that what they're going to do is – is try to use Schoonmaker to kind of replace yeah. Fergie. You know, and this is his shot. This is his opportunity. Um, and I think in, in in that section of the kind of going up the seam and being a big target in, in, in the in the area of the seam where Dak likes to throw, I think you know that's something that Schoonie can do. He's an even bigger target than Ferguson is. Uh, may, he's not maybe quite the athlete as far as like uh, getting up the field, but he is incredibly athletic for a guy right. that size. So I, I think in the past target range. It'll probably be kind of triangulated between, you know, Scooney and and maybe just a couple more extra targets for the wide receivers, uh, probably running similar routes. And honestly, they may just use CD in some of the targeting that that uh, that they would have used for Ferguson because he likes to operate in the middle of the field. Maybe you send him on a, on a seam route. So um, I do think that it's going to be a kind of a collaborative effort, right? Because, uh, you know, Fergie does a lot of things for this offense and, and who he is as a pass target eater. Uh, is not you know also you know, touching necessarily the the other aspects of his game where I think you can kind of farm that out to right. Span Brevin Ford and 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 Lipke like I said but I think as far as pass targeting goes it's going to be a combination of Scooney uh, and then maybe just a slight uptick of wide receiver targets. I think Schoonmaker is going to get a lot of the inline work like he usually does, but it'll just be an yeah. uptick in snaps there. I think you'll see him get the targets like within seven yards, right? Like a lot of these like sit routes and maybe flat routes. I think he'll probably get a lot of those, but when it comes to like key third downs, my guess is it's just going to be more Jalen Tolbert. Like I, mm. we didn't see a lot of Jalen Tolbert in week one. It was mostly CD lamb and Brandon cooks. I feel like this is probably the game for him. And we're going to talk about on tomorrow's show with Ross Jackson, Marshawn Lattimore status, because he's dealing yeah. with a hamstring injury. If he's not out there then I really expect Jalen Tolbert to have a big role because it probably means Paulson Adebo is going to be following CD Lamb. So my guess is they'll be okay for a week or two. The problem is, Landon, like once we start to get further along in the season, you're going to need Ferguson's playmaking ability and yak ability. I think they can certainly survive a game or two without it. 
Yeah, I mean, I think you know the first part of that sentence really supported the second part of the sentence there. You're right, is that I think they are going to need him later in the season, which does, to me, again, further support the idea that it would be smart to let Fergie sit out this game if possible. Yeah, and it, they've got enough tight end depth where they can get through the game, right? Like, I I expect to see more of Brevin Spain forward, like mm-hmm. just as a the number two tight end, more of an inline blocker. You just might not see as many routes run from the tight end as a whole. Maybe that means... More Cavante Turpin. Maybe that means more Hunter Lipke and running some 21 personnel out there with three receivers. But I, they've got enough weapons and enough things they can do on offense to get by a week or so. The problem is, again, once you get into the meat of your schedule, yeah. you need as many of these playmakers as possible. When you play Baltimore, when you play yeah. Pittsburgh, you're going to need these guys. So for sure. And listen, I, I listen. We are not poo pooing this New Eng- New Orleans uh, Saints. No, no, no. It's we just one, it's one game. Absolutely. I, I do think the, the other thing that, to keep in mind here is that they're going to be playing at home, which which I think you know helps the Cowboys if they want to kind of even further open things up a little bit more to kind of just you know redistribute those pass targets to a wide receiver. I think it makes a, a little bit more sense to do it this week. Uh, so yeah, if, if you had to, if you had to have him miss a week, I, I think it, it, it isn't going to kill you to have Ferguson no. necessarily miss this well, week against the Saints. I mean, and look against the Browns last week. That's one of the best defenses in the league. And Ferguson really didn't have a big role, only a couple catches, mostly underneath stuff. And you were still fine on offense. Now yeah. I think you're going to need to score more, more on offense, right? Like, mm-hmm. I don't know if you're going to get a punt return for a touchdown. Right. And the saints yeah. have a better offense than Cleveland did at least yes. going into the this week. So you might need to score 27, 28 points. And that might be a little bit harder without Jake Ferguson. And this is where I want you to talk for a minute or so about Hunter Lipke. Like if the, if the role is to not have him one for one, replace Jake Ferguson, but to mm-hmm. see an increase in snaps, what would that look like for Hunter Lipke? I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a combination. Here's the thing is that they've used him in a wide variety of roles. I mean, clearly he's not just being deployed as a fullback. I, I think when, when discussing, you know, his replacement of, of Ferguson, I think you'll see him literally line up in line at times as a tight end. Probably be, I don't think we mm-hmm. actually, Oh no, we, we actually did see that last week, but I think you will see maybe a little bit more of that. I think you'll definitely see him line up as an H, as a as an F, yep. like off the line of scrimmage as a wing. Uh, you're gonna see him as a fullback as you have, uh, and you'll see him as a running back, which is, is another thing that he's been doing. So I, I think that ultimately, what it will mean is that you know uh, uh, maybe instead of twelve personnel on this run that you want to execute you're running uh, uh 21 personnel and and he's coming off the wing and executing the same block just from maybe from a different spot right and mm-hmm. and and maybe you know you have him run a route that you would have liked Ferguson running uh against this defense but you have him running it from the wing spot or you know you know that sort of thing so i just think he's the kind of athlete that can't create mismatches because obviously you're not going to waste a corner on him. You're not necessarily going to put a safety on him with all the other weapons that the Cowboys have on the field. Uh, and so that's where I really love, love him, right? Is because you can get through all your progressions and then suddenly you get down to your last regression and, Oh, I've got a fullback mismatched with a, uh, a zone corner in the, in the, right. uh, in the flat. I don't think he's going to make that tackle if I can make it out to Fergie and 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 he's able to kind of bang away a little bit on on some of the smaller players. So, yep. uh, yeah, I I think I just think that he can be a, a, a mismatch player for down roster defenders who are kind of just taking the leftovers, and I think that that's a really great way to like you know kind of optimize your opportunities on each snap. Last thing, this is a very big opportunity for Luke Schoonmaker. Even if Ferguson plays, Absolutely. I got to assume that he's going to be limited. Like the Cowboys spent a second round pick on Luke Schoonmaker because they believe he can be a quality starting tight end. He's healthy. This is a big opportunity for him. So I can't wait to see him play. Yeah. All right, Lynn, let's uh, let's talk about some players that exceeded expectations in week one. We will get to that next. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. You've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel, America's number one sports book. We got something a little bit different for you this week. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Then with a YouTube TV base plan, you're going to be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out-of-market game. 
All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and you can cancel anytime. And if that's not enough, be sure to check out FanDuel's Profit Boost in the app and use it for FanDuel's Double Your Winnings for all of Sunday. This was week two on Sunday. Pre-game money line bets. Profit Boost will be live starting Thursday, uh, September 12th. View your account page now to learn more about your boost. Again, visit FanDuel.com to download America's number one sportsbook. Welcome back to the Locked On Cowboys podcast. We want to thank you for making us your first listen of the day. Now make your second listen to the new Locked On NFL show. Two shows every single day. First, the madman Tyler Rowland kicks you off in the morning with a double shot of NFL espresso. And then stop by the barbershop with Tony Wiggins for some real NFL talk. Add in the Locked On local experts and you get unprecedented NFL insights, hot opinions, detailed breakdowns, all in 30 minutes. It's the new Lot Done NFL, and it's twice a day. Make the madman Tyler Rowland and the barber Tony Wiggins your second listen at the new Lot Done NFL on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. All right, Landon, this next question comes from at big underscore squeak. He wants to know, great name. Uh, he said, we've had four rookies, Guyton, BB, Nealon, and Carson, all play a significant amount of snaps in week one. Which of those four players exceeded mm. your expectations the most? The most. I think that's the key thing because I would say that I, I think that all four of them exceeded my expectations. I mean, they I, yep. they all played fantastically on Sunday. So uh I I guess I I would have been really surprised, even knowing the situation with the tackles, to see Marshawn Nealon come away from this game with six pressures, man. Like that's I I, I think you know, we've seen all the Kalen Carson, when when he got into uh, training camp and started practicing, immediately looked like he belonged. Like there was zero, like at no point during training camp did he look like a rookie or look lost or look uh, uh, like he didn't know what he was doing. So when when Bland got hurt and it was, we all knew it was Carson who was going to be going into the spot. We never had any question. Like it was, oh yeah, okay, here's Carson's shot. You know, what, like we didn't even have a conversation. Like. Hey, nope. these are the free agent corners that are available. Or hey, did the Cowboys make a mistake by not signing Stefan Gilmore? I mean, we could have. I mean, maybe we're still wrong on that, but through one week doesn't seem to be an issue. You know, I think with Guyton, we've talked about Guyton all offseason long about that matchup specifically, yeah. right? And I think he struggled. I think he you know battled through it, but I think he did a fine job. I don't know that he exceeded my expectations. No, I think it was there. like right around what we were hoping for, probably. Exactly. Like, we yes. knew it was going to be a struggle. Just don't let him get Miles Garrett ruin the game. Cooper BB, I think, was the only is the other guy that could be a contender for this list because I expected him to be uh, 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 a serviceable, solid center. And I think he was a little bit better than that, right? I think yeah. he was even a little bit better than I expected. I think for me, defensive lineman is such a difficult position to, to crack into as, as a, as a, you know, as a rookie, especially, well, I mean, I think both defensive tackle and defensive, end, both very difficult to crack it now, especially when you're coming from a smaller school, right? Yeah. Marshawn Nealon definitely played some, some higher level competition. He went to the senior bowl. He definitely is not, you know, this isn't new to him necessarily, but if, if we're talking about like expectations versus where, you know, where they produced, like the fact that he came into his first game was not the starter at defensive end. You know, so he didn't get like the, the lion's share necessarily of, of the, of the snaps at defensive end, but still managed six pressures and, and, and a QB hit. And I think to do that in your first week, um, uh, I, I think that's really, really impressive. And, and it, it kind of shows you, uh, I, I think we weren't surprised about the run game stuff, that stuff. Like I, I knew that he could probably come in cause he's just powerful in the way he plays yep. the way he was able to kind of bend and get around the corner. Like that's stuff that seems, you know, more exceedingly new. And, and I think that we have gotten a player in Marshawn Nealon, that is maybe a rung higher than all of us kind of expected when we, when we drafted him. Yeah. Nealon, I thought was really good. I, I mean, you, you could see him driving these tackles back. Like I, Cleveland has some athletic tackles that don't necessarily have a lot of power. And it was just a bad matchup for them with Marshawn Nealon. Uh, I'm curious. I think there's one of two things that could happen with Nealon as the season goes along, right? Like mm -hmm. I could see, as the year progresses, I could see offensive tackles when they get more tape on Nealon, like preparing for the power, maybe we don't see him being as productive. But I also could see Nealon, the more he plays developing some counters to the power yep. and some other moves. Yep. 
if, if he can do that, now we're talking about like a real impact defender because if you have power and a couple other moves off of that, that's when you come, become really hard to stop. So if I had to bet, I think Nealon's going to be a player that actually progresses quite a bit as the season goes along. Yeah. And it, it doesn't hurt that it seems like he's got that kind of mentality where he wants to be really, really good. We just need to see him develop some pass rush moves. And maybe it doesn't happen until year two. But so far, what we saw in week one and what we've seen in preseason and the training camp, it's hard not to be highly encouraged. Yeah, I mean, I think just where we've seen his improvement as a player since college, right? Like since not having not even played games, he's improved this offseason so much. So, uh, yeah, I think, you know, as the season goes on, as he sees more, as he starts to kind of, you know, internalize uh, the his playing time a little bit uh, and seeing himself on film, you know, he'll develop counters. He's already well on his way. The fact that he's able to kind of get around the corner and be as flexible and bendy as he is around the corner is that's that's seemingly a new development. So he's already developing his game as he's going along. So I, I'm excited to see where it's going to be in a couple of games from now. Can, can I give you one non rookie that I thought yeah, performed please. expectations? I mean, DeMarvian, DeMarvian Overshone's an easy answer. So I'm not going to give you that one. How about Eric Kendricks? Um, I, I, not that I thought Kendricks was going to struggle or anything like that, but if I would have told you six tackles, two sacks, and one interception in his first game of the year, I don't think you would have believed me, right? Like, I think we've kind of glossed over just how good Eric Kendricks was because Overshone had a couple of massive plays and everybody got really excited about, rightfully so. I, I told Pete on the Locked On Sports Today show that uh, I, I got some advanced metrics from some inside folks I know that that apparently Kendricks is on pace for 32 uh, interceptions and 16 sacks this year. So, uh, or, other way yeah, around, other way, other way around, 32 sacks yeah, and 16, 32, interceptions. I mean, which is still a fine season. If you can fine, fine, it's a it's a fine season, I guess. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, look, you know, I, I think it's a couple things. One, um, clearly he's just very comfortable playing in this defense. He yeah. understands, you know, where, what his assignment is. He understands every aspect of it very deeply. And it's, it's, you know, we talk about internalizing, right? Like he's internalized this defense, you know, to himself uh, in a way that, that is second nature. Right. And, and yeah. again, it's just, he's just, he's just so instinctual and, 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 yeah. and he understands exactly, you know, he understands offenses and how they work. The question with him was, you know, how much does he have physically left in the tank? And I don't know that I saw anything from him with the Chargers that made me think that he had lost a step necessarily. It no, he's not like, the same guy he was in Minnesota, but that doesn't mean he can't be a productive linebacker. Yeah, or, or very good, you know, because yeah. he was a all pro at Minnesota. Yeah. So, you know, you know, being a very good linebacker is I, I will accept, right? Very much yeah. so. So, yeah. Uh, you know, I think having a guy like that to – it's almost like Brandon cooks, uh, right. In the same sense where it's a, he's a plus player. He's not your superstar, but the other aspect that you get out of it is that he's making all the other guys around him better too. Like yeah. he's bringing them along with him. So uh, yes, he's a positive plus player. I did not expect him to have some, so much of an impact as he did in that game. Um, but I, I do think that he is going to be a big player for this defense throughout the season. Even if he isn't like, you know, Sean Lee level of, yeah. of, of affecting the, the, the defense type defender. I, I think his presence and him being better than average uh, linebacker uh, around guys like Overshone and Clark as they start to level well, up, I think is going to be huge. And this is one of the things that I noticed when I was watching the sounds from the sidelines, which is always fantastically done always. by DallasCowboys.com. Uh, it's like he's talking to the linebackers pregame and he's being the leader, which the Cowboys needed. But like you look at some of the linebackers he's talking to and like Overshone's never played in an NFL game before. Uh, Damone Clark is a young player. I, I mean, uh, Leah Fu has never played in a game never before. Like before. You, this is why you, you need players like Eric Kendricks. And this is why it was such a big signing for the Cowboys to get him to like, just have somebody that's been in all of these wars, right? So far, so good for Eric. Hedges. Can I have one, two more people real quick? And we'll yeah. go quickly. We don't even yeah. talk. Jordan Phillips and Linval Joseph don't need to say much about it, but the fact that they were able to get in there and give you that quality of snaps early on, do their jobs, A plus. Love that. Which which one of those guys is bigger right now? Jordan Phillips. It is crazy. Like he's playing three technique and he is clearly bigger than Linval Joseph, right? Like I'm not crazy, right? You see all that too? No, it was just. Listen, you and I both watched a lot of the All-22. Compared to what we saw last year for their defense tackles yeah. to this year, like it just looks so funny on film. <laughs> 
It's like it's like it's like we were playing with with like linebackers at defensive tackle yeah. last year or something, yeah, right? It's, yeah, it's, it's it's wild. They are enormous, <laughs> and it's not it's wild to see run plays where the middle of the, uh, of our defensive line is just like two dudes standing up, going, "Yeah, well, we're not going anywhere." Yeah, they, those <laughs> like, guys, it's, those, it's those guys do not get moved, which is nope. really nice, and that's what you need in Mike Zimmer's defense. Uh, all right, let's talk about Dak Prescott, fresh off a four year deal. So, what are we going to talk about? Of course, when are the Cowboys <laughs> going to replace him? We will get to that next. This episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. It's the formula for winning championships, and it's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber and not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Welcome back to the Lot on Cowboys podcast. Every day or on tomorrow's show, it's a crossover edition of the Lot on Cowboys podcast with Rock, Ross Jackson from Lot on Saints. We talk about the defensive coordinators in this matchup. We're going to talk about uh, Mike Zimmer's impact, what Derek Carr is going to try to accomplish in this game. So make sure you tune in for that. Later, let's finish up here with a question uh, about the Cowboys succession plan for Dak <laughs> Prescott, which again, I, I understand the ridiculousness of it, but this question comes from Ollie. He wants to know now that the deal is done with Dak and he's locked up for the next five years, right? Do you expect the Cowboys to draft a quarterback relatively soon and let him sit behind Dak as early as the first round? To be clear, to the question, person who asked the question, it's a very great, it's a great question. It's yeah, it not, is. It, we're, we're not laughing at the question. They're laughing at the general idea that, that Cowboys, you know, are, are fans already wanted, looking yes. for some succession plans yeah. for running backs, quarterbacks. It's, you know, the most popular, it's the, my grandfather used to always say the most popular Cowboy uh, uh, who whoever plays the Cowboys at any given time is the backup quarterback. Oh, you have no idea. Uh, so I was a huge Clint Sterner <laughs> fan back in the early 2000s. <laughs> so I totally understand that. Um. So yeah, to answer the question, I, I and I think it's it is smart to talk about it now because like you know this you know we don't know how many of these more contracts he's going to have in his career and and as Todd Archer and we we've mentioned on this show as Todd Archer said, uh, Dak will have been if he finishes this contract will have been the longest tenured Dallas Cow- starting Dallas Cowboys quarterback in history. So and I don't see why he wouldn't with all the guaranteed money the Cowboys have tied of up course. Him. like it seems so like he it, will. It is time to kind of start considering what you need to do moving on. And I I think the Cowboys have kind of done that at different steps. You know, obviously that's part of what the Trey Lance situation is, however you feel about that. I mean, that's an effort to try to like, you know, kind of get into that situation. And I think that it's, it's a good example of the Cowboys need to have a holistic plan here. Right. Like I I think it's, it's easy to say that, Oh, the Cowboys need to draft a a quarterback in the first round and that's how they'll find their, their quarterback. That's not how the Cowboys found their last two quarterbacks, no. <laughs> to be honest. And and so uh, I think that, you know, it's it's going to have to continue to be – they need to fold quarterback into the larger plan that they have for free agency, which is attack it at all times. You know, yeah. find opportunities, find deals – uh, and 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 take advantage of them. And I think you know with the Trey Lance situation, that's one way to do it, right? To to buy low on a guy that is being sold, uh, that 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 you know uh, that somebody liked a lot that that you feel like has developable potential. Uh, and I think that that's you know one way to do it. Obviously, the draft is going to be uh, uh, the 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 most traditional way to kind of go this yep. route. So, so, it, but if you do that, ultimately you're, you're sacrificing uh, obviously a premium pick to, to go get the, uh, a quarterback. If you're talking about a first round. Now I, I do think that, you know, the, the old green Bay methodology of, of, you know, drafting a quarterback or taking a quarterback every year is another way of doing this. If you want to kind of ch- constantly churn that third quarterback spot by, you know, just kind of drafting fourth and fifth round quarterbacks well, and see if you it, hit on those. As I say, with the Cowboys having so many comp picks every year, you could yep. theoretically do that. Like, hey, we're just going to spend 
a early day three pick on a quarterback every year. And if we hit one set of every 20 picks that we spend, it's worth it. It's worth it. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, I think that they, those are all, those are three different methods of attacking this high pick, low pick free agents, you know, sure. uh, uh, weird, uh, 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 roster situations, other leagues, AFL, sure. you know what I'm saying? Sure. Like uh, you, you have to attack all of it. And I think that's the, really the key thing is that it's not, it's not going to be as st- straightforward as, okay, it's uh 2028. Uh, we're, we're getting close to the end of this deal time for us to go into the 2029 draft and we are drafting a quarterback yeah, that's a, that's and this a bad has been our plan. Yeah. You have to you have to find a couple different avenues because you don't want to get over leveraged into having to draft a quarterback right. for a succession plan uh, because you weren't planning uh, up before that. I, I just want to add in a couple of things. Number one, I think what makes this hard is you don't know who your coach or what your system is going to be for the next part of Dak's contract. Like I think it would be really easy. Not really easy. That's the way I, I think it would be easier to draft a quarterback if you knew Mike McCarthy was going to be here for the next six, seven years, and you draft a type of quarterback that he likes. But with the possibility of Mike McCarthy being gone as soon as 2025, it makes things a little bit more challenging, right? The other thing that I would say is I think the teams that have the best success doing this are the ones that aren't eagerly drafting a quarterback because they feel like they have to. They're drafting quarterbacks mm-hmm. because they like a certain quarterback, right? Like the, I don't think the Packers had any intention of drafting a quarterback during the, the MVP seasons for Aaron Rodgers, but Jordan love fell to them and they really like Jordan love. Right. Um, the chiefs now the chiefs traded up for Patrick Mahomes in 2017, but he was their number one player on, on the board by far. And he fell, I think out of the top 10 or right to 10. Right. So I think you have to be, you have to kind of fall in love with the quarterback rather than falling in love with the idea of drafting a quarterback. And I think if the Cowboys do that, they're going to be just fine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, don't, don't get too thirsty. You know, that's, that's, that's yeah. how you draft Pat poorly. Yeah. It's like when you, when you're too desperate for it, you're forcing the issue. Um, you're, you convince yourself, you convince yourself, Daniel Jones could be a quarterback in the that's, NFL that's guys. The problem. Right. Yeah. You, you know, don't want to do that. And that's and that's how you that's how you miss and that's how you get you get a bad quarterback that you still continually convince yourself can do it. Uh, you you sign him to <laughs> extensions because you have no other plan, you know. Yeah. So uh, uh, yeah. Uh, one one other thing I wanted to add in, I, I don't think it's smart for the Cowboys to draft a quarterback, let's say inside the top 100, until at least the 2026 draft, right? Because yeah. that would be going into the year two of Dak's new extension. The hard part of this is with the way the contracts are going to line up. You want it to be where you're still getting some value on a rookie contract when Dak yes. leaves. If yeah. you draft a quarterback in round one, let's say next year, by the time that guy is going to be playing, you're already going to have to be signing him to an extension. And that makes things really tricky. So I think drafting quarterbacks on day three, you can do that at any time. Drafting a guy inside the top 100, I think you have to wait at least a little bit. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Yeah. And, and in fact, I would actually say that I would probably, if you're going to draft in the top 90 or hundred picks, I might actually wait until Dak is gone. You know, like I, I actually think that the smarter succession plan is to have an intermediate quarterback. Like that's why I liked the idea or earlier, if the Cowboys had decided to move on from Dak, which again, I wasn't supporting necessarily, but I think as far as the plan goes, having a Trey Lance type, that could be a interstitial quarterback to help you lose the, enough games yep. to, to get yeah. to the drafting section that you need to get the quarterback you want. I, I think that that, that helps, right? Cause yeah. then it doesn't force your hand to like have to feel like you have to go into the next year to draft a, a quarterback out of the class. If you don't like it. Uh, and if you do like it, you can, you can go and get a guy at, at the top of the draft. You can trade if you want to, but Having a, a, a third option there, like someone already in house to kind of, you know, bridge the gap a little bit. Ta- yeah, yeah a, a take away some of the desperation. I, I think that that would definitely be beneficial and, and and just help you. Like I said, not draft thirsty, which is really a problematic for for when you're trying to get a quarterback. All right, that is it for today's show. We want to thank you for making Locked On Cowboys your first listen every single day. Go make the new Locked On NFL your second listen. Two shows every single day. One in the morning with Tyler Rowland, one in the afternoon with Tony Wiggins. Go check them out. They are absolutely fantastic. Go download our podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We are free and available 
on all platforms. Check us out on YouTube as well. You can follow Landon on Twitter at McCoolBCB. I'm at Marcus underscore Mosier, and we will see you right back here tomorrow.